The Lord is good. Austin, can you bring up that song? Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture burst out my sight. Angels, no, that's not the one. We'll go back. Go to the other one. I'm going to find it. Go to one of the other verses. Yeah, there it is. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am in my Savior and happy at best. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Wow. That's just good stuff. That's my sermon today. If we could get that, <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> so I, I just want to say that. Thank you, Mike, for affirming that everything I'm going to say is right there. Appreciate it. So, the Lord is good. I'm going to start out by reading First Peter 1. Verse 3. Jody's going to read it for us. I want you to, to listen. Just listen to the truths of this verse as she reads it. Don't we love technology? But Nate's going to hand you one. <laughs> okay. First Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven with, for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Filled with an unexpressible and glorious joy. I don't know about you, but it's really, really hard to find joy in my daily life right now. Um, we're in a situation with the COVID and, and just say all the crazy people. I don't know how many crazy people you run into a day, but I run into quite a few of them. And, and, and it took me a long time to figure out, it's like, okay, people are doing crazy things, I can live with that. But what I've realized is, you know, with my gifting, I, I pick up their emotional violence. <laughs> Maybe that's a word that I would use. To, you know, all the non-verbals, all the tension, all the, you know, you walk in a room, you ever walk in a room and the room just goes, oh, yeah, it's tense. Well, it seems like every place I go and everywhere I go, I, I'm going from one situation to the next situation to the next situation, and I'm bombarded with that tension. And I will be the first one to admit, my joy isn't always, praise Jesus! Isn't it great? He loves me! <laughs> Should be. Uh, but I'm going to be the first one to admit that it's not. 
And so in our time of suffering, I don't think it was interesting. We, we had a small group on Friday night. <laughs> and uh, so we just kind of checked in with everybody and said, how's everybody? And pretty much around the room, it was like, everybody's fine. Everything's good. Everything's fine. Everything's good. And I went, wow, OK. And so we went on, did our little thing, and then we broke up. The ladies went off into a room and prayed for each other and the men. And, and so I kind of shared where I was at and with this tension and, and, and the struggles I'm doing. And it just like right down the road, me too. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, we're not doing really good. And so I think this passage um, deals with when we are constantly under the bombardness of... And I'm going to use the word suffering because what's happening in the world today is pushing against everything that we are. It's a form of suffering. It's a form of trial. And some of us are yelling and screaming at the cars going around us more often than we used to. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that more people honk their horns. I'm hearing more horns. It feels like I'm in New York City. You ever go to New York City? It's like, nah, 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 nah. That's driving down. That's all I hear. I hear horn honking. I hear this. I hear people. And it's like, wow. Um, so, so in all this pushing and pressure, can I be honest enough to say that my behavior has not been what it's supposed to be? <laughs> Have I graciously spoke, compassionately cared, generously gave? Well, I generously gave, but I'm not sure it was passionately loved. <laughs> Am I the only one there? Does, does this all make sense? So I think the message we, today deals with, guys, we're here. We're in the middle of it. We're, we're struggling. And, and, and some people are financial, and some people are, you know, have I been exposed or not exposed, or will I get exposed, or I've got, I've got COPD. If I get exposed, oh, my God, what's going to happen? Stress. Uh, stress and trials can be the same thing. You know, I grant you, we're not at the Colosseum, and we're not thrown in a cage, and not going to be brought out in front of the Roman Colosseum and, 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 and eaten by lions. We're not in that. That's not that trial. But I, I want to validate the level of trial and suffering that, that we're in this world right now. Let me just say, the kingdom of this age, Satan, is in rule, and he's pushing hard against the world. I talk about the eschatological contentions of the two king, kingdoms, kingdom of this age, Satan, kingdom of God, and there's this tension between. Guess who sits in the middle? Us. Ecclesia sits right in the middle. And when one kingdom is going, when this king's going, we're celebrating. And when this one's pushing up against, we're complaining. But has the nature of God and his kingdom changed when either one pushes? That's what this passage is all about. So, Romans 8. Let's start there. Because this is talking about these kingdoms and this tension. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? Amen. Romans 8, 31. And the answer is, no one. Going on to verse 37. No, in these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor, the, nor, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, or any else in all creations will be able to separate us. Who will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Amen. So, in these tensions... Those are truths. Those are foundational truths that we hold on to. So, we also know that 1 Peter writes this book, and in 1 Peter 1, 2, 12, he kind of lays out why we should be submitting to our uh, government and submitting to our bosses and, and, and respecting and, and all that stuff we're supposed to do. We've been talking about it for weeks. It's here. Live such good lives among pagans that throw they, 
that th though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. See, that's it. See, are we going to live a such a life in these situations where <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians it talks to those who do not believe we are the essence of death, but to those who believe we are the essence of life. Well, here's the thing. When we do good and live godly, to the ungodly, we smell like death. We affect them. Now, sometimes that effect, the Holy Spirit can come in and transform it, and sometimes they take out their stick and beat us. But we're going to stink one way or the other. We're going to smell like Jesus, or we're not going to smell like Jesus. And, and that's what this is all about. So in our journey... In our hardships, in our trials, are we smelling like Jesus and are we proclaiming his name in such a way, are we allow allowing the evil desires that dwell within us to control us? That's the question. Now we get to the text. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22 is the text we're looking at. And he starts with, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? <laughs> You know, Peter just likes to throw it in your face, doesn't he? Just kind of like, you know, who's going to harm you? But here's the reality. We are extremely naive if we believe that God doesn't allow suffering in our life. Because, by the way, he sent his son who suffered and died for the unrighteous that he is righteous. So he did it to his son. By the way, think about just one of these things in life. God, Satan's sitting around, and God looks at Job and uh, Satan and says, So, you ever thought about my man Job? <laughs> I don't know how to talk about that one. I mean, that was like, huh. But what, what, what I know, or we go on, Joseph. Joseph was destined to be a leader. Look what he had to go through before he became the leader that eventually saved the children of Israel from dying. John the Baptist, head on a platter before the king. John, the one Jesus loved, sitting on the Isle of Patmos, a rock in the middle of nowhere. Some day, some guy comes out in a boat once a day, throws him a piece of bread, gives him a, a, jar, a jar of water, goes away. Comes back the next day, gives him a piece of bread, gives him water. And that's John's life. But if you ever read the book of Revelation at the very beginning, while John, on the, on the day of the Lord, he was worshiping. So he's out there, he's, he's loving Jesus. And the angel of the Lord came and interrupted him and gave him the book of the Revelation. The important part, it wasn't the angel came and interrupted him. In his current circumstances, he worshipped the God Almighty. And his circumstances didn't define how he lived or act or talked. That's what this is all about. So the first thing we have to deal with, if you believe that you're not going to suffer because you're a Christian, sorry. But, but, but we're told that. We even act that way. We go around thinking, well, I'm just going to do all this because then God will love me and bless me. Yeah. But, but by the way, let me just say this. Living right and godly will also divert a lot of suffering. <laughs> There's a truth, but it doesn't exempt you from suffering. And, and so what's the reason why? It's that God's up there going... You know, Richard, I haven't tormented you in a while. I think I'll just torment you today. You think, is that the he God of heaven? I don't think so. Wow. Richard, there's some things going on in you today. You don't like it. I don't like it. We've agreed to work on it. You ready? Let's go. <laughs> For his kingdom's sake, he will allow suffering. So, 
Going on with the passage. Putting my earpiece back in. Sorry, Nate. Okay, let's try not to do that again. Verse 14. But even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. By the way, the word blessed, sometimes we get confused with it. If you, even if you suffer, Mike, for doing right, be happy. You are happy. I, I move the word from blessed to happy because happy and blessed is kind of a synonym. Mim, 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 mim. <laughs> Whatever that word is. Um, and, and, and we, oh yeah, I'm blessed. I ain't happy, but I'm blessed. No, we're happy. You know, we go back to Matthew, uh, the, the Beatitudes. And, and very often the word happy are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of God. The word blessed and happy are interchangeable. Happy are those who mourn, for they will, be fine, they will find comfort. Happy are those that are meek, for they will inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they will be fed, filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed, happy, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And happy are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Guys, right there. In the time and the world we live in, let's be peacemakers. In the middle of all the tension we have, can we exercise that ability to bring the peace and the love of God into every environment that we have? Blessed are you. Here's the last one. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Happy. Blessed. <clears throat> I can't do that. It's hard to be happy right now with all that stuff that's pushing on me. But scripture says I'm to be happy. So I have a conflict. I think it's mine. I don't think it's God's. <laughs> so, so I have to... I've got to realign some things in me to stand in that position. Because remember, we started with this whole inheritance kept and, and, and protected and not stolen from us. That, you know, all the things that First Peter started with. Did you hear all those wonderful things? Well, when I hear those... My response should be, wow, that's awesome. That makes me feel happy. Blessed. There's a disconnect in me. What is that? Let's go on. 14. I'll read it again. But even if you should suffer for what is right, do not f uh, for right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be afraid. Okay. I don't know about you. I'm talking about me. That's probably you too, but hey. Um. What prevents me from holding on to those promises? It's probably because something over here, you know this tension I talk about? What's the other side of this tension? The tension is... I am so self-absorbed with living the life here and holding on to what my, my marbles I have here. And the more I hold it on here, I'm not able to grab on to here. Does that make sense? Did you, did you follow all that? Now, some of us do it better, some of it do us worse, but when we're in suffering or when we're in stress, what we do is we go back and we... We don't grab on to the precious promises. What do we, we, we say them. But remember, things that we say, <laughs> but if we don't believe them in our heart, then, then, then they're just great words. And we keep saying them up here until they get down here into our core being. 
and, and that's what I do, you know. But, but I, there's some things here I must be holding on to. And, and you know what, by the way, it's not because it's my new car. It, it's not because I have a great boat. It's not because I have a fancy house. It's not possessions. But you know what, I hold on to this because I have four children that I love. I hold on to this because I have a wife that I love. I, I hold on to this because I have friends that are dear to me. And, and they make me come back and hold on to this. And I have to remember that most of those people are united me in Christ, and so we should hold on to it over here. <laughs> but sometimes I get stuck over here because what happens if I'd lose Jody? Now, i, I got to tell you, it devastate me. I, I, I don't know what would happen to me. We've been together 30-plus years. And if I lost her, I, I, I don't know who I'd be. And I think that's a good thing, that you didn't know who you would not be, you know? Um, so sometimes I hold on to her and, and, and what it is and what it is, and I hold on so tight that I don't hear, you know, what, what didn't... Uh, it was Noah, correct? No. Noah shared this morning? Yeah, Noah. You know, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it graciously. I don't ask God, God, why am I holding on here? Please let me know so I can release it so that I can hold on to her over here. But somehow I keep it over here, and when I keep holding on to the things that are over here, I'm not happy. I'm not blessed. I'm not walking in the fullness and the blessing that the Lord has for me. Somehow I have to figure out how to get over here. And, and I, I think I'm a yo-yo. Boom, 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 boom. You know? <laughs> I don't know about you. Is that how your life is? That's how my life is. That's how I'm walking out my salvation. And I think that's, that's part of this. So I'm just trying to honestly kind of talk about it. So, I don't like this next statement, by the way. Matthew 10. Do not fear the threats. Do not be frightened. Matthew 10, 18 says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both, both the soul and the body. We go back to this fear of God. I think if we hold on to things here too much, it's because fear and we're frightened and we're fearing the wrong thing. The fear of God is righteous and holy. And it, it, it's, it won't burn us. But that's, that perspective is what we have to have, not fearing the things of this world or in this tension. And when, I, when fear takes over, then we, become bond, and we have bondage in it. Make sense? So, verse 15 gives us a hint. So if you're in this struggle, and some days you're over here, but if you're over here, I think you're okay, but if you're over here, what's it say? Put in your heart, reverent, put in your hearts, reverence, cr- but in your hearts, thank you. Reverence. Somebody's going to have to read that because I'm lost. Go, Jody. Yeah. Do you hear that? Richard, what's the reason for your hope? Ooh. Nate, what's the reason for your hope? Never leave me. Ooh. Mike, what's the reason for your hope? Ooh. Good. Avery, what's the reason for your hope? Ooh, these are good. Delane. Oh, he's always good. Jody. Ooh. Lisa. By the way, I think I could do this for another half hour. You guys will keep pumping them out. Um, but what I'm going to encourage you to do is 
in the season of time that we're in, you might need to go and spend some time making your happy list. Writing it out. And, and you might need to look at it two or three times a day, especially when someone cuts you off. Okay, let me get, not go to my happy place, let me get my happy list. <laughs> you know? And, 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 and when we're in times of suffering and trial, sometimes we have to artificially bring things into our life to remind us of the truths of who are God so that we don't hold on to this and we start holding on to this. And, and I think it's really true. You know, when, when we talk about, you know, put in your hearts, reverence, reverencing Christ as Lord, always be prepared, giving an answer to anyone who asks you. You know, um, we talk about the word ready. We talk about the word stand. Um, when, when we, when in Ephesians it says, put on the full armor of God, and when you've done everything, stand, and when you stand, stand. It uses the word stand twice, you know. And uh, did anybody here wrestle? You ever wrestled? You understand the, the whole concept of standing. Because because when you've done everything, put on the full armor of God, stand. And then stand. Prepare yourself to receive what is coming. Just don't sit there on the balls of your feet not paying attention. Nah, come on. Come on, Richard. Let's go. I got you. <laughs> you may have a foot on me and <laughs> about 40 inches on my arm, but I'm, I'm standing. Because no matter how big the, the impact is, he who started a good work will finish it. We are more than conquerors. But our part is standing. So in this time of trials and persecution that you may be in, stand. And the first thing is make your happy list. Make the things that give you hope. Write it down and read it. And if you have to memorize it or put it on your forehead so every time you look in the mirror, you go, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, come on, that was funny. A little bit funny? Okay. <laughs> so, always be ready and prepared to give an answer. My whole life, that verse was always be ready to preach the gospel. You know, always be ready to get someone saved. Well, it's not meaning that. Now, in the process of you sharing why he is so great, that person might come to the Lord. Oh, please, every time. But this being ready to be pre and prepared isn't about going to get someone saved. Being ready and prepared is going, holding on to your hope, and because you are there, you will be the essence of life, and in that, people will recognize it and be drawn to that. But it isn't the product of salvation. No, it's not the wrong word. It isn't the methodology to salvation. It's a product of a lifestyle so that people can see. Make sense? Hear this. If we are not ready to give an answer of our hope, I believe we don't honor the Lord in our life. And when I say that, it's in that area we don't honor. We may honor over here, but in that area. If we're choosing not to be ready, that's... Again, it's, it's an obedient thing. It's a lifestyle thing, you know? So, oh, be prepared to speak the reason for your hope. And it adds this little gentleness and respectfully. <laughs> I haven't really done that well in my driving lately. My head language on the people that drive around me, I just go crazy on them. There's no gentling love or respect in it. Now, you could be sitting in the car and have no clue that I'm just going, you know. 
and, and as I looked at this passage, I said, you know, I, th I think... I think when someone cuts me off or, or the situations or the craziness at Walmart or whatever, I need to be going over my list of my hope instead of going down my list of what I think of them. And if I think I do that, it positions me in the right place to live in the fullness of that hope, which in end results makes me happy. Verse 16. So, be prepared. Do it respectfully. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak malice against you, against your good behavior in Christ, may be ashamed of their slander. See, this byproduct of living godly, this byproduct of acting and doing the right things for the right reasons with the right motives, Believe it or not, no, by the way, this is, doesn't, it's not, doesn't go. Every person will go, oh, look, you believe so well, it's great. No, half the people are just going to take you to task. But there are people who are going to be looking at you, and because of your life and because of how you deal with the pu pushing in of this kingdom tension, they're going to go, wow. And, you know, they're going to go, you know, last week I was talking about Richard. I shouldn't have done it. I need to go apologize. I don't know if you've ever had that happen in your life. I have. When, when I'm doing better, not worse. <laughs> Things like that happen. And I start building a relationship and we start talking and they, they get to know about Jesus and all of a sudden, they're loving Jesus. It works. It works, but it has nothing to do about evangelism. It has everything to do about living a godly life. So, oh... Here we go, 17. We pretty much already talked about this, but we'll do it again. For it is better if it is, if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for evil. This is, it's better. Both before God and our lives. If we live a godly life, if God wills that we are to suffer, it's better that such things take place. Because of his kingdom. I like to hold on to life. <laughs> when I'm holding over here, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to do it for Jesus. But when I'm over here, there's such a freedom that says, you know what? God, for your kingdom, I'm going to go proclaim. John the Baptist, go proclaim the Messiah is coming. And he had to get out of the way. And so he went to jail and was beheaded. For the kingdom of God. Christ. For the unrighteous. He who is righteous. For the unrighteous sake. Picked up a cross. And died. I mean I can go on. I can go on and go on and go on. About how many people have said. You know. If it is so. And I am your servant. I am willing. I don't know. It's a hard place to live every day. Just see if you're grabbing on to life over here. So when we're grabbing on to our hope, eternal, and we know who we are as a child of God, and our identity is fully, securely fastened, and circumstances are not defining who we are, then we are able to say, okay, okay, boss, I'm going into the fire. Meshach, Shadrach, and Menico, we're doing what's right. We're going into the fire. Do you know there was five people in there? Meshach, Shadrach, and Mendigo? And there was a fifth one. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abendigo. Wasn't there four? Meshach, Shadrach. Oh, oh, I'm just doing double names and counting. Okay. I love dyslexia. There was four in there. <laughs> <laughs> the scripture, I was like, what? <laughs> Meshach, Shadrach. And Abendigo, there we go. Um, I, somehow I split the first one, and me and Shaq was in there together. <clears throat> but <laughs> the point is, yes, thank you. 
<laughs> the point is, is that there was, Jesus was there with them. And see, that's the thing we need to know. You know, in every place we do, in every place of hardship and suffering and pain that we have, guess what? Jesus has experienced it, and he can relate to where we are, and he's in the furnace with us. It makes us bless. And it is better for God's kingdom for me to go into that furnace than, you know what? I'm going in. Let me say this. There's a common belief in a lot of people that, well, Jesus suffered and died for me, so I have to suffer and die for him. And so they put themselves in suffering situations all the time. That is not Jesus. Please don't do that. If it is God's will, go in the furnace. Oh, I just got to go in the furnace because it's, you know, he just died for me. Oh, no. (laughs) Ain't no happy there. (laughs) Ain't no happy there. (laughs) So, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in his body, but made alive in his spirit. That's it right there. The greatest thing that makes me happy is my unrighteousness was answered by a righteous man. And he took care of it all. And all is all. And clean is clean. And healed is healed. And I'm okay. Even when I'm over going, okay, (laughs) and hanging on to part of this life over here. And he's going, Tony, come on, let go. Let go of that finger. Okay, okay. Next one. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's part of our life. You know, it's, it's, you know sin and death entered into the world. And, and, and we're stuck in that tension and we have to struggle with it. And it's okay to struggle with that. It really is. It's not okay to let it win. Never okay to let it win. Because he won. That's what we know. So verse 9. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamations to the, important, the imprisoned spirits, to those who are disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and the water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from your body, but the pledge of a cleanse clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm not going to get into he ascended into hell three days, set the captives free, came back. Uh, you want to come over to the house and we can have a wonderful theological question about is it was the essence of Christ? Did he actually go to this? Who are the prisoners? Da, 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 da. I'm going to boil it down real simple. There was a problem. Those people needed to be saved. God figured out how to do it. It got done. Got it? Make sense? That's the important part. And, and, and why is this in the middle of this passage? Because those who were suffering long ago, God had an answer for them, and it got solved. That's why we have hope. And that's why this passage is in the context of suffering. Another way to say it, Richard, God's got your back. What's your problem? He's figured out how to solve it before you have. And he's going to do it way more creative, and there's a good chance you won't even have a clue on how he did it. So how's that? You like that? You want to talk about the theology of it? Come over to the house. There's, we can talk for hours. How to do, Richard? You like how I did that? Yeah, okay. He's, he's going, I'm really curious how you can do it with that. But I do want to deal with one piece of it, and it's the baptism point. Um, It was only eight people were saved through water, and the water symbolizes that, and the water, excuse me, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not of the removal of dirt. Okay, let's get a bit really clear. Baptism doesn't save you, okay? But it does, it does say baptism save you. It, it, it says that. So we have to kind of wordmonger this a little bit to understand it. 
And I think it's important to understand it. And part of it is in the next sentence. Because in the baptism, it's a pledge of a clear conscience toward God. Oh, my baptism, I'm going to do it your way. And it's because of the resurrection power of Jesus. So <clears throat> what I would say to you is when, it, when we talk about baptism saves, I believe baptism is the first step of sanctification. Okay? We talk about salvation, it breaks down into three parts. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Justification is Christ died and made me right. And then, you know, Paul talks about work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That point to the end is where we join with God in the sanctification process, which is salvation, until he comes back and we have salvation for eternity. So God handles that part. God handles the first part. And what I believe is baptism, because it's talked about, is the first step that says, you know what? As now a believer, I'm going to go be baptized and have an outward sign of an inward heart that my conscience has been clean because of the redemption of the power of the cross. And I'm going to declare to all that I'm his child. And I am walking out this salvation. How'd I do? Does that work? I'm looking at your heads. Any of this? And they're like, what do you say? But, but, but it's really important. Because people do, there's people who go around and say that you have to be baptized to be saved. No. Is baptism a condition of justification? No. Is baptism one of the conditions within sanctification? I believe it's so strongly written about in Scripture, I would say, you don't have to. If you don't, I'm good. I would say yes. If someone tells me they have to be baptized, I would say, I think it's really, really important. I think it's your step of saying, responding to what God did. It's that whole thing of, you know, believe in your heart and, and speak, Lord and Savior, Lord and Master. Master says, baptize. Oh, baptize. I'm baptizing. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a condition for justification. But it is one of the early first steps for saying. That's one of the reasons I personally believe if Scott Wheeler over here got saved just right now, let's get the water out. Let's baptize. You want to be baptized? Yeah, let's do it. Boom. You know, this whole thing of waiting four years and making sure they go to 20 classes to know what they're doing before we baptize them. No, I think you baptize them, and then you send them to class. Um, but those who do the four years, it's still in the process. It's still in the sanctification process. You can't wait the glorification to get baptized. So I wanted to just deal with baptism a little bit there. Um, it gets a lot more complicated, but that's the core. 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Wow. It comes back to the God of heaven somewhere. You know, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Made a plan. Before the, before the world was created, they had, it, they had the plan. And the plan was that Jesus was going to come, and he was going to have authority, and he was going to come back and sit at the right hand. What, what, what that does in the point of trials and suffering and persecution is I know that God's got it handled. I know that his ways and his purposes are better than my ways and purposes. And if I can let go of my life here and embrace my life there, I will walk in a blessing even if I am in suffering. Wow. And you know what? That takes the whole sanctification process until I get the glorification to do. Anyone who says, oh yeah, I got that down. <laughs> you know, I have a calendar reminder. Uh, I was saved in 1971 in July. So every, every July it pops up and says saved. So it's 49 years I've been a believer. <laughs> now if this is it, I'm, I'm still working. <laughs> I'm still in the process. You know, I haven't got there. But I'm going to keep, 
keep, keep going. So, in our day, we must remind those who are being oppressed for their faithfulness to Christ to avoid using any bitter language, retaliatory speech, however great and tempting it may be. You hear that? If we're going to going back to, if we're going to be persecuted, we do it. We have to guard our tongue in times of trials. Come on, Amen. There you go. <laughs> or it's like, oh, yeah. Well, I'll start that today. <laughs> okay. Instead, they must learn to be respectful and humble. We must learn it. In the middle of all this, humility, respect, gentleness, kindness, fruits of the Spirit, all need to be alive in our life. This is the hope that ought to sustain them as they endure suffering, the hope of which they are to be ready to speak, and the hope that Peter urges us to embrace. It all comes down to hope. The hope that we have. All this stuff that we can hold on to it. It prepares us. It gives us hope to endure the things that we have. And we have to embrace it. We have to be willing to say, Lord, the situation I'm in right now, if it's your will, I'm in. I'm in 100%. I'm not just going to go in one foot. No, if, you're got me, if this is the place that you have me right now, then I'm in. I'm in all. All of me. Your will, your kingdom. And you hold on to that hope and you endure. Because it will get over. And by the way, if I took a rope and started it right here and walked that way and then walked that way and walked around that way and then walked up that hallway and came back here and brought the rope to this other side and if I took one little microscopic fiber of the tip of that hair, that would be, or that rope, that would be our life compared to eternity. You know? And it's in this microscopic thing that we hold on to so greatly. We have to start letting it go and see the eternity that we have in front of us. Because knowing that eternity is there brings us hope. So, <clears throat> how will I do this? How will we do this? Think of this. I'm going to use the we here. I'm including you all in this. If you agree, in your heart, say amen. We will be ready to give a reason for our hope. We will not conform to the sinful habits of my, our peers and friends. We will remain faithful to the teachings of Jesus by living faithfully and obediently. We will endure lonely nights and few friends, if that's so. Yeah, I didn't like that one. We will find our friends in those who seek and obey God. That doesn't mean we don't make friends that are not ungodly, but our core friends should be seeking and obeying God. We will look forward to the day when God shows his faithfulness. Yeah. Those are some we can do's about. And if we walk that way, I think we're learning how to deal with the sufferings and the trials and the things we have in our life. Because we have a hope. You know that song? We have a hope. We have a freedom. You know that song? Oh, great song, Mike. Anyway, it's called We Have a Hope. You know, it's, it's, yeah, sing a song and no one knows it. Well, there you go. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, see, she, she knows it. She likes me. We have a hope. So today, I'm going to encourage you to look at your list, your reasons, to be ready to stand. And, and if you don't know them real well, then you might need to work on getting that list. I'm going to encourage you to take that list and share it with your spouse. And if you're not married, share it with a friend. Or share it with your spouse, 
Share it with your children. Share it with your friends. I think it would be good to share it currently in our situation a lot because the more we speak it, what happens? The more we believe it, the more we act on it. Be the light of the world. Don't put a bushel over. Let your light shine. And be prepared to give a reason in every situation for the hope that you have. Amen? Go in peace, love one another, and be happy.